Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign K0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Now, in this episode, I'd like to address two questions, which are essentially the same question. The first is from uh, Stephen uh, Hartley, KC0YVZ, and an almost identical question from Thomas R. Jackson, KY4NF. Okay? And so I'm going to answer them both at the same time, because uh, they're very nearly the same. Uh, before I jump into that, I'd like to pay a special thank you to a user who has a username of Hugh Bassoon. And he's got numbers on either side of that. So I don't know if this is a nickname or his actual name. But uh, whoever you are, Hugh, thank you very much for being a patron of this channel. I appreciate the financial support that you've provided. It helps me to pay my assistant and things like that. If you would like to become a patron of this channel, go to patreon.com slash ke0og and find a way that works for you. So let's look at these questions. I'll draw them for you. There are condominiums very commonly built in a row like this. And the condominiums have walls between them and hopefully your neighbor isn't loud. Okay. So these are all condominium units. They have in common the driveway out here. So you're going to have a car, a car. Sometimes these garage doors will go underneath and then you live upstairs. And sometimes there's even a third entrance up there. Now, all of these condominiums have doors here in ostensibly they face this way. Actually, they face this way because you always go in and out via the garage. Now, the electrical service is buried. And if you've got a townhome that's like two floors and then the garage for the car, okay, the, the service will be over here, the electrical service. And it will be grounded right there. Okay, you each have separate electrical service. There's no connection between them. Sometimes the porch lights and stuff go on and off automatically. It all depends on the condominium. Now, invariably, the ground rod for this is right there. Okay. It's right next to you where you've got your electric meter and your panel. Sometimes the electrical panel is actually inside, but the meter has to be outside so that it can be read. But the panel ground might actually go to something buried in the concrete, uh, for example. Okay. Now, here is the problem that uh, our two readers have in common. They could almost be in the same condo group. They've got this is where the windows are to let the light in. And there's windows on the first and second floor. Uh, in the U.S., uh, that's first and second floor. In the U.K., that'd be the ground and first floor. But uh, they have, uh, and, and the, the garage is in what is considered the basement. Okay, so often uh, they'll put, you know, you'll put your ham shack right here. Now, this gives you a problem. You can usually run a wire out to the front and put a ground rod, a wire out to the front and put a ground rod right there. Okay, and you can ground all your equipment and everything like that, just like you're supposed to do. And uh, one has some woods over here where he puts his antennas up in the woods where nobody will notice. He's probably slightly buried that line, so it won't get cut when the grass has grown. Uh, I'm not sure the antenna status of the other. It could be up on his roof. It could be um, on an upstairs balcony. It could be out in over here. Uh, if you put a mag loop out here and tune it remotely, then you don't have a... I mean, it doesn't even look like an antenna, okay? 
So you've got this problem that your ground is out here and the utility ground is utterly inaccessible. Now, if you go by, I'm sorry to use green, I'm running out of colors. If you go by the electrical code, this and this should be bonded together. But you never want the bond to run in the building. So what do you do? I mean, ideally, uh, you would be able to, you know, tunnel underneath or in the concrete, below the concrete, below the rebar, or use an oofer ground that happens to be right there, or run a perimeter ground that's got ground rods around it like that that can uh, support all of these like that. And there may be something to that effect over here. But what you've got to do is go to that one and you really don't have a way of connecting to the other. Is that ideal? No. No, it's not ideal at all. Will it work? Yeah, probably. Very few hams meet all of the National Electrical Code requirements for radio installations. Um, if you look in the Motorola book, if you go to Ask Dave number 8, and uh, it has an extract there from the Motorola book that shows how hog wild you can go with grounding and some of the things that you can use. But yes, definitely have the ground rod right outside the shack. Now, note that any equipment that has a three-wire ground plug, okay, you've got your two plugs plus the ground plug here, all of those, the ground here is connected to this ground over here, okay? So that means that you've got a kind of a virtual path for example, in your power supply, most power supplies are like this. The green wire ground is actually attached in a power supply. You've got plus, minus, and you've got 110 coming in here. And this goes to, you know, da-da-da-da-da, whatever. But this is attached to this. That means your negative is attached to the green wire ground. And I've measured a couple power supplies, and this is indeed the case. So this is going to provide a path between there and there. But it's a tenuous path, and it goes between uh, two different grounding systems here. And if lightning strikes over here, the voltage potential here and the voltage potential here will be different. Okay, That's the reason for bonding them, is so that they won't they'll all float at the same voltage together, okay? But it's really hard to avoid this. So you're going to have to beware of ground loops, which will become apparent if you have any of the symptoms of having RFI loose in your shack. And you may have to play with moving these things around. Never, never defeat a green wire ground. That is asking for safety issues like crazy right there. Now, I will recommend for you, if you live in a lightning area, during the lightning months, the only time you should connect your radio is when you're using it. Okay? Uh, and that includes unplugging your power supply. Um, you can leave it attached to the ground if you want or completely disconnect it. Okay, so we have got the situation. We've got ground on one side, ground on the other, and there's no way to properly connect them. First of all, do not run a nice thick wire between the two inside your house. Because if there is lightning, there could be very heavy current along that wire, and it could cause a fire. That connection wire should be buried. Okay, and it should have intermediate ground rods in it too, but that's getting into a deluxe ground. So uh, you'll have to try it without doing that. Try to get it to where you've gotten your 
RF so it doesn't get into the shack or do any strange things. Do not defeat any third wire green wire grounds. There will be a three wire ground plug on your power supply and there may be one in other equipment in there. Um, usually the one in the power supply is about the only one, but that does connect by direct electrical path to the ground on the back of your uh, radio. You've got a ground lug back there and that is connected to the ground lug of the power supply, which in turn is connected to the green wire ground. Okay, not to the neutral, but the green wire ground. Okay, so I think you can make this work. Lots of people do make it work. Uh, it's not ideal, but you do need that ground rod outside your shack, both for noise elimination, RFI elimination, and uh, for some measure of uh, protection from nearby lightning strikes. I have suffered a direct strike uh, in my past, um, and fortunately I had my radio completely disconnected. Um, it was not connected to anything. It might as well have been in the box. And um, the, there were a few other things in the, in the shack that were messed up. The power supply was messed up. It cost me a whole dollar to fix that. I had to replace an IC. And uh, there was a problem with my tuner uh, one of the capacitor plates had shorted over and the coax blew out, literally blew out. And the antenna, 20 meter antenna dipole was vaporized. So um, the guy across the street saw the flash hit and he saw my antenna being vaporized. So it was quite a dramatic strike. It also ruined our garage door opener and ruined the modem that I had on the computer which I had paid $350 for. This was a long time ago. So anyway, I survived that without uh, too much of a problem. And there you have it. If you've gotten this far in the video, I'd like to ask you to subscribe. Please subscribe, click like, uh, click the uh, button to get notified for upcoming videos. I publish several times a week, some little short video like this. Hopefully you'll find it helpful, or hopefully you can refer somebody else who might find it helpful. And if you would like to help support this channel financially, here's an alternate. You can go to decastler.com slash support and find a way that works for you. Until we next meet, 73.